प्रभाष Dr. Prabhash, we can start now. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, I'm introducing my uh, friend, Dr. Uh, Arun. Uh, he is the Assistant Professor of Gastroenterology, Department of Digestive Health and Diseases, Chennai. The visiting consultant in Wildrop Hospital, Chennai. He is the Director of Chandra Gastro Liver Clinic and Endoscopic Center, Chennai. Area of, his area of interest is post-liver transplant, immunosuppressive guidelines, plasma presence in ACLF, is a life member of ISG, uh, ISG, INASL, SGEI, and IAP. Arun, uh, please take over and uh, uh, present the hepatic cancer surgery. Thank you, Dr. Prabhash, for your very brief introduction. And good evening, respected professors, senior consultants, and my dear friends. Uh, it's a really great, joyful pleasure for me to meet you all once again in this wonderful rainy evening uh, to discuss something about hepatic encephalopathy, which is happening. Uh, most of the time in the patients with liver disease. And uh, I, before starting the discussion, I would like to talk something about Dr. Prabhash, who's uh, one of the uh, leading uh, senior lead consultant neurologist uh, practicing in Apollo Vanagram Chennai. He's one of the close friend of me. And uh, without any, the discussion won't be complete today. And uh, I would like to thank Prabhash. And also I would like to thank Sun Pharma who gave me a, a chance to be a part in this forum. And to discuss about the main area right now, hepatic itself is, uh, so if you want to discuss something about that, uh, it's one of the very complex area to be discussed and very frequently you'll be encountering in your practice day in and day out about hepatic encephalopathy. Because uh, many physicians, this is my, my area to talk more to the physicians, also to the practicing gastroenterologists, also to the training PGs who are being in this field. And uh, the main intention for me is, see, how will you recognize a patient with hepatic encephalopathy at a hernia presentation? And because once a patient develops over hepatic encephalopathy, which means the patient is going to stupor a state, the patient is being comatose, once a patient is being entering in that state, uh, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, at that point of time, if you're going to diagnose, most of the time, the chances for the recovery will be very low. But uh, when you're going to diagnose hepatic encephalopathy, the initial presentation itself, that it's a main area for us to be taking the lead for the discussion right now to identify the patient with evidence of covert hepatic encephalopathy or minimal hepatic encephalopathy features. What are the areas is that should be discussed? And hepatic encephalopathy, if you are going to think about that, it is a reverse, I mean, it's a reversible neurological dysfunction, which is going to happen in a patient with uh, liver cirrhosis, I mean, it's a neurological dysfunction in the form of altered mental status to deep coma in complicating, I mean, which, which is being going to be complicated in the presence of acute or any other evidence of chronic liver disease. So to discuss briefly about the history, so right from the before the birth of Christ, the discussion about hepatic encephalopathy has been started uh, by Hippocrates uh, to describe the association between jaundice and acute behavioral disturbances. And there are many more history and to describe something about Morgagni, which were well known about the Morgagni's Lennox cirrhosis was a man who consumed alcohol, who misused and followed by the evidence of hepatic encephalopathy and the evidence of agitation. And there are so many history uh, which is being there to be discussed. And moreover, the one hour area of to discuss something about hepatic encephalopathy will not be adequate because it's just such a voluminous area, it's such a lengthy area to clinically predict how will you manage, what is the path of physiology of hepatic encephalopathy and uh, how to recognize the complications, how to recognize the presentation, how will you manage it in an earlier way and what is the indication for various modalities of other line of treatment, what are the new innovations in the field of hepatology to discuss something about hepatic encephalopathy and what is the role of liver transplant? There are so much of areas to be discussed in a short period of time. So I need to rush up my discussion, uh, but the main area to be, but I would like to enlighten the main area of what we're supposed to know right now. So uh, the term hepatic NCAF has been coined by Fuzzy Gas et al. in 1957, and it's also been minimal hepatic encephalopathy has been identified by Squamaras and Amster in our, at around 1998. So as I discussed with you, 
is a irreversible i mean it's a reversible neuropsychiatric state of brain dysfunction that is main entity for me to discuss and next to that it can be predisposed in multiple conditions it could be because of hepatocellular failure or it could be shunt process during the shunt because if the shunt is not going to function well the fundamental hepatic failure cirrhosis of portal cable anastomosis is a post tube patient this kind of pathology can be there for a patient with hepatic encephalopathy so uh, the main area is how many percentage of patients see if you are going to talk about liver either the patient is going to present with evidence of compensated cirrhosis or the patient going to present with evidence of decompensated cirrhosis once the patient is going for decompensated cirrhosis there will be around 16 to 20 percent definitely will be having evidence of hepatic encephalopathy and moreover 30 to 40 percent of the patients will do in, in I mean, if the patient is going to have cirrhosis, me, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the patients, there is high possibility for them to go for hepatic end cap and overt hepatic end cap, which means stage three, two, three, and four and above, the overt hepatic encephalopathy can happen around 10 to 14 percent of the patients in general. As we all well know, TIPS is one of the bridge therapy before liver transplant in a cirrhotic patient. If you're going to plan a patient for TIPS therapy, that is also high, higher chances for the patient to go for hepatic encephalopathy at the rate of around 10 to 50 percentage. And cohort hepatic encephalopathy, which means uh, minimal hepatic encephalopathy with evidence of stage one hepatic encephalopathy, it's nothing but cohort hepatic encephalopathy. There will be high possibility for this to happen. Around 20 to 80 percent of the patients can present. And don't think that once a patient presents to you with evidence of hepatic encephalopathy, and once you start the treatment, after everything will be okay. Don't have nothing like that. Once a patient even becomes stabilized and followed a period of time, the patient can develop a bout of recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. Also, at around 40% of the patients can develop a bout of HE, recurrent episodes. So uh, this is about as per the AASL portion statement, also by the EASL guidelines. So hepatic encephalopathy right now being classified as overt as well as covert, and then the type A, B, and C that I'll be discussing in my upcoming slides. And overt encephalopathy is very easy to recognize based upon the clinical presentation and based upon the common bedside investigations. As I discussed with you, the prevalence is almost around 30 to 40 percent. But covert, how do you covert encephalopathy? How is it possible for you to recognize? Because uh, the neurological part will be fine when you're examining the patient. The mental status will be fine, but you should recognize there are so much of tests there nowadays. The innovation in the field of hepatology has been grown up so uh, there's so much of tests there. So battery of tests that should identify the abnormal psychometric evaluation. So which will predispose to around 60 to 80 percent of the patients for hepatic encephalopathy. So this is a reason nomenclature as per ASL statement. So if you want to define hepatic NCAP, you need to remember three major things, whether it is type A or B or C, or whether it is episodic or persistent or recurrent. Simple. So always you should remember if it is type A, it will be associated with acute liver failure. The patient will be having acute liver failure followed by the patient will be developing features of HE. In this presentation, the pathogenesis will be slightly altering. The chances of progression of cerebral edema, the chances of accumulation of ammonia will not be very, very characteristic like what's happening in a patient with cirrhosis if the patient is going to present to you with evidence of acute hepatic failure. But in type B, if you're going to have a congenital systemic shunt or portal systemic bypass, but there is no evidence of any intrinsic hepatocellular failure in these kind of patients, you can also develop hepatic encephalopathy. That's nothing but type B. And type C is very common and tidy if you're going to develop hepatic encephalopathy in the background of cirrhosis and in the background of portal hypertension. As you all well know, the portal pressure is going to be high, the wedge pressure is going to be high, along with that, the evidence of splenomegaly, uh, variceal bleed, that's a point of uh, portal hypertension to be assessed. So once a patient is going to be in type C, whether it is episodic, which means one episode in a period of six months, or whether it is recurrent more than one episode in a period of six months, or whether it is a uh, persistent, which means uh, the the encephalopathy will not be touching the baseline and most of the time will be presenting. See, if you're going to see this graph, which means persistent encephalopathy is nothing but most of the time the graph pattern remains still in the higher line, which doesn't touch the baseline. So 
How will you diagnose hepatic encephalopathy? See, this is the basic definition. And if you want to have a diagnosis about hepatic encephalopathy, there are so much of criteria being used. And my intention to brush up your knowledge about the basic few criteria like West Haven's criteria. So West Haven's originally proposed by Khan et al. And in 1978, it's most widely, but the problem is this West Haven's criteria, uh, there will be having an inter-observable variability. If you're going to look into that, See, always you should remember stage 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And stage 0 and 1 will be taking over into the covert features of hepatic encephalopathy. And 2, 3, and 4 will be taking over into the features of overt hepatic encephalopathy. So always, based upon the level of consciousness, your intellect and your behavior also upon your neurological finding, I think that Prabhash is going to give a brief outline about this neurological finding. So, uh, so based upon your level of consciousness, if you're going to think if the patient's normal, or lack of awareness followed by this comatose status. And what about the intellect? See, always you should remember regarding the intellectual behavior, most of the time the patient will be having a short attention span. If you're going to talk something to the patient, the patient couldn't be able to follow, they'll be thinking about something and they will not be able to reproduce what they're going to say. And they couldn't be able to reproduce a place, they couldn't be able to reproduce I mean, things, what they've been using. And they'll, they'll be having a slow, a slow slur of speech most of the time. And uh, the sleep latency is going to be come down and the patient will be having abnormal sleep pattern. And there are so much of things is going to happen uh, before the patient sets into a comatose and stuporous state. And next to that, the neurological examination, always you should remember the classical presentation of asterisks, that means flattening tremor will be more common, at uh, least uh, will be more common in the patient with the uh, I um, mean, West Haven stage two rather than more, but it can also happen in one and three also. But in West Haven stage two, it's more characteristic. And once a patient is going for stage three hyperreflexia, that means decorticate posturing is going to ensure which means followed by the one patient going for stage four uh, decelebrate, which means the final stage is going to set in before the patient is going to die. So. Uh, this is about the outline, about the basic, this is about sonic classification, nothing but spectrum of neurocognition in the patient with serotic background. So this is another new classification, what have been used in multiple newer textbook like Skip and Slicing, what they've been considered about that. This, this is nothing but from covert to over, what they've been discussing, the cognitive dysfunction and reduced level of consciousness as the stage is progressing. This is the same thing what I've been discussed with you. And next to that, this is what the previous mean. There's episodic, recurrent, and persistent. And uh, there are other scoring system apart from uh, this uh, West Haven's criteria, what we are frequently using. And next to that, uh, uh, about uh, sonic classification that covert and overt hepatic encephalopathy. And there are one more classification, what is called as HESA. That means it's nothing but, see, these are all very brief because I want all the pages to listen to this area because hepatic encephalopathy storing algorithm because this separate entity can be asked most of the time during the exams. So hepatic encephalopathy scoring algorithm is ideally classified by as an inner child and always it'll be having a low intraobserve variability. And see, what is the reason for using this HESA? If you're going to be taking four components into an account, I don't want to discuss each and every component, but it's mainly based upon the clinical assessment and neurological assessment and followed by the hepatic encephalopathy grade determination. So you need to see this, whether the patient fits into stage one or two or three or four uh, before discussing the management of hepatic encephalopathy. This is another interesting entity, what I've been discussed and a few days before also I've been discussing to some of my pages about uh, clinical hepatic encephalopathy staging scale is nothing but chess. So uh, even the recent guidelines have been mentioned everything about the chess, it has been coined by Oritz et al. It to improve, uh, it's been slightly improved area for, for West Haven's criteria. So it is going to be used West Haven's also the Glasgow coma skin. As we all know, Glasgow coma is nothing but Three major entities, the motor, the verbal, the eye opening. It's very easy to recognize. The lowest score is three, the highest will be 15. Always it should be in fingertips for most of us. And incorporates the WHC and the Glasgow comma scale, which is going to run between the zero to nine, which means zero is normal and nine will be the patient will be in a comatose phase. So it's very easy to administer. So if you're going to see this chess, uh, this is the same thing, but the question pattern will be very simple. But how many patients we have been looking into that? How many times we have been diagnosing? How many practitioners have been using this kind of scale? And if you are going to download this scale and we are going to use in a daily routine practice, I think you can able to recognize covert features of hepatic and 
encephalopathy and rather than patient to progress to over hepatic encephalopathy we can able to recognize the patient the earlier presentation which means we can have very simple questions like which month the patient belongs to which day the day belongs to like that so many simple questions are being there and you can have a look on this flow chart about the clinical hepatic encephalopathy is changing scale so next to that is modified orientation log, which is a new addendum in the field. Uh, it's nothing but uh, it's usually been used in case of traumatic brain injury, but there is a modified, it's mainly based upon the, to define the severity of hepatic encephalopathy. And this is a, I mean, uh, this is a condensed uh, area to discuss what are the various changing system like West Havens, I mean, hepatic encephalopathy, chess and four. What do you mean by four score? That is also been used mainly. Four means the, the, the full outline of immune perception, which is going to be used. Uh, four score, if you're going to do, means the time required duration will be around 10 minutes. Uh, there are, I mean, see, all the scores can be used, chances, but most commonly what we are going to use is nothing but West Germans criteria, HGSA scoring, and apart from chess and four can be considered but most of the time, the patient's time can limit of doing this test will be around 10 to 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So the main area of our interest to discuss right now about the pathogenesis in hepatic encephalopathy is such a complex phenomena to be understood. As we all well know, right from the undergraduate to postgraduate to specialty level of training, you see what we have been understood about the basic pathophysiology is nothing but the ammonia effect. So what's going to happen in case of ammonia? What is going to happen if the intestinal dysbiosis is going to set in the neurosteroids, genetic backup, benzodiazepine hypothesis, and so many years to come when we are discussing something. And this has been the newer thing, newer addendum in the discussion of hepatic encephalopathy about the pathophysiology. There's nothing but uh, so what's going to happen if the patient's going to develop hyperammonia, ammonemia, and followed by the patients having impaired lactic metabolism, energy metabolism is going to be impaired, oxidative stress, systemic inflammatory pathway, and those things I'll be discussing in my upcoming slides. Okay. So regarding the intestinal dysbiosis, suppose if the intestinal bacteria is going to get overloaded, which means uh, a short bowel syndrome, if any of the problem is going to set in, that will predispose to your bacterial overgrowth and followed by the bacteria is going to contribute to the production of ammonia. So to discuss about the ammonia, which is the main key neurotoxin being involved in the pathophysiology. See, simply I will tell you about what's going, what the ammonia is going to do. See, uh, regarding the ammonia pathophysiology, suppose if you're going to take a non-nitrogenous substances, so what is going to do, it will be converting into the proteins and through the, in the colon. So what is going to happen? It is going to release the ammonia through the protein, proteinaceous products. So once the ammonia is going to release, what is going to happen? This ammonia is going to be uptake into the liver. Once the liver is going to uptake the ammonia, what is going to do? It is going to metabolize further because the urea cycle, as we are all known right from your basics, the urea cycle is as well known in pediatric age group. There are many enzymes pathway have been involved in that, right from ornithine, citrulline, phenylastate, glutamate, so many pathway, phenyl benzoate, so many things, arginate and arginose succinate. We can talk in whole day and night about the urea cycle disorder itself. So once the, through the urea cycle pathway, uh, these things is going to be metabolized, this ammonia is going to convert to urea. And what is going to happen if the urea is not going to be formed and if the urea is not going to be eliminated through the kidney? So what is going to happen in the patient with liver cirrhosis? The ammonia is going to build up in the liver and it is followed by the ammonia. It's going to increase in the bloodstream. Once the ammonia is going to be increased in bloodstream, what is going to happen? It is going to cross a blood-brain barrier. Once ammonia is going to cross a blood-brain barrier, it will predispose you to cerebral edema, which means which causes astrocytes. Astrocytes is nothing but uh, it is main substrate which is being involved. And uh, I mean, if you want to discuss something about the astrocytes, it's uh, the main, it provides key nutrients as well as mechanical support for all the neurons. And uh, it also involves the ion transport and the neurotransmitter uptake in the brain. And see what's happening once the astrocyte is going to be affected, what happens is going to be predisposed to cerebral edema and uh, osmotic demyelination and cerebral lysis. And this kind of thing uh, is going to set in, and the patient is going for cerebral edema, and finally, the patient is going for hepatic encephalopathy worsening of states and comatose and death that's going to enter. So the main pathway is ammonia pathway. Once the ammonia is going to raise in the brain, what is going to happen? The ammonia, ammonia is going to get converted to glutamate. 
this glutamine is going to increase in case of uh, uh, once the glutamine is going to be more accumulated in the brain, which will predispose to osmotic um, you know, cerebellum and other complications to set in. So this is a basic pathophysiology about the ammonia, I mean, so urea production impact and followed by the glutamine accumulation. Ammonia is going to be metabolized to glutamine. This is the basic path of physiology. See, what is this ammonia sink is nothing but the ammonia is keeps on producing, which produces a, a toxic effect in the brain and followed by every I mean, uh, uh, excess of glutamine is going to be accumulated. Nothing but the ammonia sink pathway is going to be activated most of the time in patients with hepatic and care. And there are certain new concepts about this ammonia, what they've been discussed. Once the hyperammonemia has been there, the translation process is going to be affected, the protein modification is going to be affected, the ribosomal activation is going to be affected, and followed by the patient, uh, uh, many post -trans many translation modifications and other things is going to happen, followed by many uh, uh, neurotransmitters is going to be released. And there are so much of pathophysiology I've been mean, discussed about the ammonia hypothesis. And it also causes the alteration in microRNA. See, these are so many new innovations that have been discussed uh, daily. So much of new pathophysiology is being coming into the discussion about. So even it be involving the alteration of microRNA and other things to produce a pathophysiology of hepatic encephalopathy. That's the main neurotoxin effect of ammonia. Uh, this is how the simplest diagram. See what is going to happen. The glutamine is going to accumulate, followed by astrocyte swelling, and cell edema is going to get ensure in case of ammonia toxicity. It is going to set in case of cirrhosis. So, uh, so, so, what are the pros and cons about this ammonia? See, if you are going to think about the pros, uh, which means the GA bleed, which will predispose to increase in the ammonia, which will predispose to hepatic encephalopathy. But what are the cons? Suppose if you are going to inject a patient, uh, what are the cons in that? If you're going to inject a patient with ammonia, doesn't mean that you are going to have evidence of hepatic encephalopathy. And there are certain hyperammonemic junior cycle as we all know, not all the patients are going to predispose to hepatic encephalopathy. And so you should know that even the ammonia is doesn't going to influence the prognosis, it doesn't going to depend upon the stage in which hepatic encephalopathy is going to present. But even then, ammonia is going to have the prognostic prognostic importance of ammonia is still a questionable issue to be discussed. Apart from that, multiple other theories are there. One is because of inflammatory theory and much more multiple other theories is being that can be considered in the pathophysiology of hepatic and kiflopathy. So inflammation is nothing but once the patient is going yeah, to yeah. develop it, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So what is going to happen? The patient is going for SAR, sepsis, severe sepsis, organ failure, the patient is going for death. And followed by there are multiple predisposing factors like alcoholic hepatitis, ALF, and other things is going to ensure once the inflammation is going to set in, various markers, inflammatory markers is going to get released, like tumor necrosis, interleukins, all those things which will be disturbing your blood brain barrier. And it is going to increase the diffusion of ammonia into an astrocytes, which will also predispose the neurosteroids release. So once a neurosteroid is going to be activated, what is it going to do? The GABAergic pathway is going to be inhibited. Other things is going to set in. So if you're going to see the increased blood flow, what is going to do? The blood brain barrier is going to get disrupted. The lipopolysaccharide activation is going to be there. And neuronal dysregulation is going to set in the pathophysiology of hepatic and careful birth. This is nothing but a neurosteroid study. This has also been discussed. So what is going to happen? The neurosteroids, so in ammonia, they won't say inflammation, there will be increased evidence of ammonia. Once uh, in ammonia gets increased, there will be increased evidence of neurosteroid, like uh, TPSO is going to get formed in that. And this trial will be predisposing to activation of tricarboxylic acid cycle, and also it increases the level of GABA synthesis. Once the GABA is going to neuroinhibitory factor, so the hepatic encephalopathy is going to set in. So, uh, so uh, that's why there are GABSA receptors, uh, antagonists, and so many other drugs being tried in this entity based upon the neurosteroid theory also. And this is one interesting theory, is nothing but oxidative and nitrosoactive nitro stress. So what is happening? So once a patient is being having high levels of ammonia, the patient will be having a evidence of activation of ROAs and NOS, RNS is going to be there, which means uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species is going to be activated, followed by what is going to happen? The patient is having 
astrocyte senescence. Once a patient is astrocyte senescence, what is going to happen? So for all we see, if you're going to treat the patient with hepatic encephalopathy, but even then the patient is not going to improve much. And once the patient being improved with the basic symptoms, and when you examine the patient, the patient will be having minimal inhibition. They'll be having a in a long memory is going to calm down. The response inhibition is not being uh, not going to be there, and followed by the learning capacity activity. Everything is going to come down most of the time, even if you are going to treat. Which means the astrocyte is going to senesce and permanently most of the time. That is a main mechanism. This is nothing but a Trojan horse hypothesis. What is the Trojan horse? The Trojan horse is nothing but a Greek mythology, which is going to be. So this is being a wooden or statue. It has been completely engraved in that. Like this, the once the glutamine keeps on accumulating, once ammonia builds up, once the glutamine keeps on accumulating, uh, so in the cytoplasm followed by mitochondria, what is going to happen? It is going to release uh, multiple tyrosine residue, residues, alter the intracellular patterns, alter the intracellular proteins. It is going to affect the transcellular substrate in your brain, followed by it will be predisposed to osmotic overload, that will predisposed to cerebral edema. This is nothing but a Trojan horse hypothesis which be frequently asked most of the time in our exams during a preparation. So apart from that, manganese theory, this is not, not much of use if you are going to, manganese, if you are going to develop, I mean, uh, if it's going to deposit in your basal ganglia, that will also predispose to Parkinsonism-like features. Another clinical picture can be happening in manganese theory also. These are not much of issues to be discussed and genetic theory. If there is any polymorphism in the glutaminase gene, which is a key part, key component in the metabolism of uh, glutamine. If there is any polymorphism, if it is going to happen, that will also going to predispose to uh, hepatic and cephalopathy. Uh, those are all the other things to be discussed. So there are many new entities which have been given in the new guidelines. Yeah, what is the bile acid pathway? So, uh, so if you are going to discuss about the bile acid, so if you, the main thing, the bile acid, if the patient presses, suppose if you are going to treat a patient with maternity disorder, or if the patient is going to be treated with lactose for the evidence of hepatic encephalopathy, uh, this bile acid is going to be a substitute, it will be going to involve the secondary pathway of bile acid production, and this bile acid will be increasing in, uh, in the patient with uh, hepatic encephalopathy also. That is also the main predisposing factor. Sometimes these things have been involving, and apart from the neurotransmitters, various neurotransmitters like NNDA pathway activation, so many other, so many protein receptors, so many pathways are being there, and brain energy metabolism. See what is going to happen if there is evidence of glycolysis if there is evidence of insulin substrate is not going to be functioning well, uh, these are so many brain energy metabolic factors, lipolysis and other things, which will also predispose to cerebral edema and other complications. And blood brain barrier permeability also may worsen cerebral edema and other complications to setting. And uh, these are all the new theories been discussed and very old there is not not much of fashion nowadays but even then some drugs are being still available in the market for this kind of theory garbage theory and followed by flumazine and other drugs can be uh, being discussed and benzodiazepine theory garbage and gopsa receptors and antibodies. so many other things is coming and this is false neurotransmitted amino acids which means uh hypothesis what is nothing but uh the aromatic amino acids should not go high in our body only the aliphatic amino the branch chain amino acids has to go high that is why we need to substitute the patient with BCAA. If the aromatic amino acid, if it is going to go, what is going to happen? It is going to form a false neurotransmitter uh, that will also be disposed to neuro inhibition. So these are all the various words that has been used in the pathophysiology of hepatic encephalopathy. But now, uh, once you are going to discuss about the clinical presentation about hepatic encephalopathy, there's nothing but, so it's mainly a clinical history taking. How does the clinical picture manifest? Only the clinical signs uh, and symptoms along with imaging will be used to diagnose uh, hepatic encephalopathy in a steroidic patient. So uh, you need to do a careful neurological examination to assess the mental status. So the mini mental status, assessment, the mental status, assessment, so many scorings are there. We need to use a careful neuropsychiatric assessment 
followed by we need to assess the changes in memory, concentration, cognition, everything to be assessed, and West Haven's criteria, Glasgow Coma Scale, and mini mental state examination. The mini mental state, if you are going to look into that, it will be comprising a score, 11 questions will be there, comprising a score from 23 to 30, uh, minimum to maximum. There are so many queer based upon the orientation, recall, language, so many things are there to discuss something about mini mental state examination. That is a separate area of discussion. Apart from that, so uh, we need to look for the neurological, focal neurological findings. See, always, hepatic encephalopathy, you need to diagnose the HE only if you rule out the other possible causes. So hepatic encephalopathy is always a diagnosis of exclusion. If any patient in the background of cirrhosis comes to you with evidence of neurological comorbidities, neurological complications, a focal neurological deficit, doesn't mean that the patient is having evidence of HE. Always you need to think about the organic pathology which is happening in the CNS. So we need to look for the other subtle neurological motor abnormalities that can also happen in a patient with hepatic encephalopathy like hypomania, which means a mask-like phase can be there, dysarthria, increased to articulation being uh, improper, followed by a toxic gait may happen. These are all the other neurological features can be there in a subtle presentation. And apart from that, the DTA dependent reflexes may be high, or may be increased, and asterisks, as we all know that Asterisks is being characteristic in hepatic and capability as per West Germans stage two, but it can happen in other conditions as well. Well, no, it can be a renal intoxication and other conditions also. It's mainly because of the antagonist, agonist and antagonist imbalance due to disturbed diencephalic motor centers. So once your diencephalic motor centers, if it is going to be disturbed, the asterisks can be a characteristic presentation, which most of the time during a clinical examination we will be eliciting. Once the asterisks will be very clear, which means the patient is being progressing to hepatic encephalopathy stage two, which is a very classical presentation most of the time when we are examining. And this is a outline what you have been discussing, the Parkinsonism features, hyperreflexia, hypertonia, altered sleep pattern, sleep latency, and fetal hepaticus. There's not much known discussion on that, but fetal hepaticus also can be seen in some patients. If the patient is having high level of, because of excess ammonia load, the patient will be having attributed to a volatile sulfur compound because of a diameter sulfur, which is going to be identified in your breath. Sometimes in cirrhotic background, you can be able to identify a fetal hepaticus also. As they all know, the rare manifestations will always happen in case of hepatic encephalopathy, like hepatic myelopathy, which means a motor paraplegia, spasticity, other things can also present, followed by few patients can develop a Parkinsonism and extra experimental signs and symptoms, which means uh, uh, balismus, hemibalismus, followed by toxic and other symptoms also can be present. to discuss, you know, how will you recognize the patient with evidence of minimal hepatic encephalopathy? Because uh, very easy to recognize the overt features, which means the theory and full, and the covert hepatic encephalopathy, a minimal hepatic encephalopathy will be, most of the time, uh, will be unknown enemy, which means it will be uh, very difficult to recognize, which means, uh, so how to define a patient with covert hepatic encephalopathy, which means when you're going to examine a patient the, in the background of liver disease, uh, the clinical presentation will not be yielding much and the neurological examination will not be yielding much by looking into the history, but only when you're going to subject the patient for a neuropsychiatric assessment, I mean, uh, neuropsychiatric assessment or neurophysiological test, uh, there are plenty of tests are there for a neurophysiological assessment. You can able to diagnose covert when you have covert hepatic encephalopathy. So ASLD in ASL question statement, what they are being mentioning about, as we all know, covert hepatic encephalopathy will be there for 20 to 80 percent of the patients in the background of cirrhosis. And OHC starts with grade two with the evidence of asterisks and disorientation most of the time. So covert is nothing but a minimal hepatic with West Haven's grade one. So 30, 20 to 80 percent of the patients can be the, and uh, usually this covert hepatic encephalopathy can progress to hepatic encephalopathy, a florid hepatic encephalopathy, which means over stage three and four in more than 50 percent of the patients over a period of three years. That is the most important entity for me to discuss. And apart from that, there are multiple risk factors. Even after that, the patient is consuming alcohol, if it is B and C, and uh, if the patient is having evidence of viruses, which is not going to be there, if there is any precipitating factors, which is going to trigger the covert features can be developing in their overt hepatic NCAF also. So what is the natural history of covert? It can be unchanged, it can be improved, 
it can deteriorate, it can develop a overt hepatic encephalopathy. Also, see, once a patient develops a covert hepatic encephalopathy, it's very disturbing most of the time because you couldn't able to really lead a normal life. Your routines will be disturbed, your family life will be disturbed, your mentality will be disturbed, your social stigma is going to come down, and there is high risk of mortality. You couldn't be able to drive, you couldn't be able to navigate, you couldn't be able to concentrate in your work, and you, you will be having frequent falls. That means around 30 to 40 percent of the patient will be having a frequent falls when they are going for the routine activity, which will predispose to fractures. And most of the time, you will be having social, I mean, I am in mean, unemployed status, followed by uh, sleep disturbances, which will be there most of the time, and multiple uh, nocturnal waking episodes will be there. And the memory and uh, learning ability is going to come down. And most of the time, you will be in social, I mean, the stigmata, I mean, the, the, you will be, most of the time, will be uh, having a, this kind of presentation. That has to be recognized early by hepatologists when you're tackling a patient with covert hepatic encephalopathy. So this is a wonderful paper being submitted by Praveen Sharma et al. And uh, the patient is going to present with a male of more than 15. And if the CF of that, I'll be discussing critical flicker frequency, if it is going to be more than 39. And we are going to measure the ammonia levels, if it is going to see the ammonia levels, if it is going to be more than 84. In this presentation, in the background, the predictors are being used for assessing a patient with minimal hepatic encephalopathy, the various predictors. So always when you're going to diagnose a patient, we need to take a good history, a clinical examination. That's the most important thing. And there is no standard gold test for the diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy. Even if you want to diagnose minimal hepatic encephalopathy, there is no single test. And there are plenty of tests. Every effort. See, always, I told you before, HE is always a diagnosis of uh, exclusion, you need to rule out uremic encephalopathy, you need to work in terms of hepatic septic encephalopathy, and there's so many other complications. Uh, the neurological picture has to be analyzed properly before labeling the patient as hepatic encephalopathy. So, which means the lower grades of encephalopathy will be progressing to higher level of involvement, followed by changes in motor presentation and consciousness may be absorbed, and with progress in neurological deficit can set in, followed by, as I discussed with you, uh, this is also one more test and tidy. That means there's a smooth pursuit eye movements if it is going to be involved. That's also one more clinical pointer. Now, that's uh, uh, that smooth pursuit of eye movements also can be assessed in the patient with the hepatic NKF. And uh, once the patient develops stage four, uh, these things are all really going to be impaired and this data coagulation and other complications also can be presented. So, so the deficit in attention, visual spatial abilities, fine motor skills, everything is going to come down. And always you should remember there are plenty of differential diagnosis for hepatic encephalopathy. You all remember alcohol intoxication. There are so many symptoms, daily reinforcements, alcohol withdrawal, vernix encephalopathy, and electrolyte imbalances. Always you, you should remember that. Hyponatremia, hypercalcemia, can predispose, and hypomagnesemia, and drug abuse. If the patient presents to you with benzodiazepines, overdose, opioids, overdose, and type diabetes sometimes the patient will be having diabetic ketosis that will also predispose to cerebral edema so these kind of presentations can all be ruled out in the differential diagnosis sometimes the psychiatric disorders the better brand just a minute And sometimes a psychiatric disorders also, some complications can be there. Also organ failure, acute kidney injury, or uremic encephalopathy and septicemia, and other complications can happen if the patient, always you need to look for the differential diagnosis in the patient with hepatic encephalopathy. And uh, this is about the diagnosis of minimal hepatic encephalopathy. There are plenty of tests which are being available. And the key intention for me to show what are the various components? And my intention is not to discuss each and everything. See, uh, in, we need to know about the psychometric evaluation, which means uh, there are so many tests. If you are in your daily practice, you'll be seeing number connection tests. We'll ask the patient to draw. Uh, we'll be asking the patient to draw the number connection. We'll ask the patient to trace the line. We'll ask the patient to blow serial dotting and block designing digit symbol. There are so many tests are available to analyze. The, if the patient score, if it is going to be uh, less than minus four, it is always diagnosing. And if it is going to be less than minus six, it indicates a poor prognostic indicator. So 
this simple score can able to recognize most of the time the patient in covert hepatic encephalopathy couldn't be able to proceed with that. And this is another interesting entity apart from uh, uh, psychometric evaluation like serial dotting, number connection, and uh, digit symbol and all. Uh, this is another new entity about R bands. What do you mean by R bands? It's nothing but repeated repeated battery, repeatable battery and neurological assessment scoring system. That is also can be used, R bands can be used. But in this, uh, it's not much uh, being used nowadays because it has been focused in two areas. One is based upon the cortex and another one is based upon the subcortex. Hepatic encephalopathy patients predominantly worse in the subcortical component. So this has to be practiced mainly by the psychologists and this co and that's the limitations of its use much and it's been used in patients with schizophrenic and uh, Alzheimer's patients. And there are so many other neurological tests like EEG, visual potentials, Berra and critical flicker frequency can be used. And this one interesting most of the time we'll be taking for a thesis discussion, this critical flicker frequency, what you're going to do, you need to flick, see what is going to happen to your retina. See, always we are knowing about something about diabetic retinopathy. What is it, hepatic retinopathy? Which means uh, because of this uh, astrocyte, which is going to swallow in case of spherical edema, the retinal sites also is going to be involved, undergoing edema followed by uh, hepatic retinopathy is going to set in. In order to recognize the hepatic retinopathy, we need to flicker the light frequently and we need to make the patient to sensitize how many episodes they can able to recognize the frequent light flickering, which means the threshold should be around 38 to 39 hertz has to be there. So if the, that, there is some drawbacks for this critical flicker frequency to be assessed, which means if the patient, uh, the, the binocular vision has to be intact as a patient if it is growing old and the patient is having some of the medications for and the patient is wearing any glasses, these are all the I um, mean, a setback for this chair, but even then, critical flicker frequency can be used in an easy bedside assessment and no need for a psychologist. It's a short period of time consuming and minimal cost if you're going to analyze in your bed test. There are other computerized analysis like inhibitory control, cognitive research, scan test. Briefly, I'll be discussing something about ICT. What is this ICT in the evidence of hepatic end curve? See, always when you're asking the patient, if you're making, see, only this is based upon target and lure. What do you mean by the target and lure? Always you should remember if you're asking the patient to identify X followed by Y and followed by X and Y. Suppose if this is not going to happen, if the patient is going to be X followed by X means the patient has to stop there. X followed by Y followed by Y means the patient has to stop there. So if it is not going to happen, if the patient is having difficulty in recognition X, Y, X, Y, rather than X, 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 or Y, 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 like that if the patient is having difficulty in recognizing these things, which means this is also a very easier way to analyze your hepatic encephalopathy in your earlier presentation to identify the patient who is having covert features of hepatic encephalopathy. And we can do approximately around 40 attempts of this ICT. And this separate entity about co covert hepatic encephalopathy can itself be answered as a short note for the, all the PG to be discussed and apart from that the cognitive drug research and so many other things like the scan tests can be used and apart from that the, the, the true uh, smartphone application system so this is a new entity what is going to happen if you're going to see in the uh, right bottom see if you're going to see yellow green and red the yellow has been plotted here as uh, in blue letter and red has been plotted in yellow letter so the patient has to be identified the yellow component in blue correctly so if the patients couldn't be able to recognize these chairs in a, a digitalized fashion, if the patient couldn't be able to recognize uh, if the cutoff time, if it is going to be more than 190 seconds, uh, uh, there is a true smartphone application which is being easily downloadable in the net. So if the patient's cutoff time is going to be prolonged, which means the patient is going for evidence of hepatic and but this is what there has been shown uh, based upon the NCFL app application system which is being available easily download for, downloadable for most of the systems. This is nothing but a continuous reaction time. So what is going to happen? Uh, see, already this is based upon the decibel of sounds. How many decibels of sounds you are going to analyze? Based upon that, you need to respond to that. So minimum two minutes to a 10 minutes test. This is a, a basic instruction has to be done and followed by every time at the random intervals, we need to produce a sound at the rate of around two to six seconds. The patient has to re identify the reaction time index. That's the uh, main entity for identifying a patient with CRT index. So these are all the tests can end with the motor reaction, sustained attention, inhibited control, or all well, con uh, well, these are all the key abilities in daily life functioning has to be assessed. And apart from that, serum ammonia, uh, nothing much about serum ammonia, but 
uh, always elevated blood ammonia doesn't mean the patient is having hepatic encephalopathy because it can identify, you can elevate in other conditions. You may also it can identify in urea cycle disorders, hyperammonemia disorders. I mean, uh, so many other conditions are there. Uh, so always doesn't mean that elevated ammonia uh, is a point of our HE. That's the main thing. And how will you take ammonia? It should be uh, in a vacuum container and the immediate samples has to be taken. And you should not, I mean, when you're sampling the ammonia, make sure that you should not use any tonic or restraints before taking a sample. You need to take a sample from the stasis free way to identify uh, the levels of serum ammonia. Lumbar puncture doesn't yield much, but in case of differential diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy, we can use a uh, lumbar puncture to identify any infections. And also, the new entity or CS of glutamine levels, because as we all know that the glutamine can be increased in the patient with hepatic encephalopathy. So CS of glutamine levels can be used to analyze, but this all doesn't going to determine the severity, doesn't going to determine the prognosis. So nothing much of use about these conditions. And apart from that, the spec analysis based upon the neuroimaging techniques, PANS, CT, MRI, the diffusion weighted imaging, the attenuity recovery, there are so many things are being used in that. So spec studies can be used and to identify the increased flow in the basal ganglia, but it's more expensive. And using a technician tracer can be done, but these are all more expensive. There are, this is a list of tests is available the flare sequence, which means fluid attenuation and invasion recovery sequence. There's so many sequence of tests have been and the magnet degradation and spectrometry. See, in this main thing I would like to discuss, we need to identify the peaks. So whether the peak of glutamine is going on, glutamate is going to be high, whether the myo-inositol and choline signals is going to come down. So we need to identify everything. So uh, based upon this scoring system, we need to categorize the patient. Suppose if the scores are normal, if you're going to do all these scores, if you're going to take at least one or two scores, if the scores are normal, wait and retest the patient for every six months uh, to re look for evidence of neurological abnormality. But if the scores are abnormal, which means the diagnosis of minimal hepatic encephalopathy is established, so you need to start the patient with basic line of therapy, followed by based upon the clinical behavior, um, family history, friends history, mini mental status, examination, uh, based upon that, we need to categorize the patient with the possibility of MHE or uh, unlikely to be a feature of minimal hepatic encephalopathy, these things and all uh, to be categorized. So this is nothing but a simple questionnaire. What is going to use the four sip questionnaire? Am I, am I eating much less than usual? Am I maintaining balance? My routine physical activity? Uh, or irritably? Or do I act irritably or impatient with myself? These are all basic questionnaires uh, that we need to ask to analyze the patient with minimal hepatic encephalopathy. This is also the same thing what I've been discussed. So if you need to look for the basic test, if it is normal, uh, then we need to can redo the test again after a period of six months. If it is abnormal, then we need to level the patient with covert hepatic encephalopathy. So the remaining area for me to discuss right now, how will you treat the patient with hepatic encephalopathy? See, uh, very important because most of the time, many physicians and surgeons when they be discussing with us, uh, so the managing a patient with hepatic encephalopathy is very complex and uh, will be a tough one to tackle because there are new innovations still happening. And out of the dose, how will you I mean, establish the severity? Based upon that, we need to calculate the dose and other management has to be there. And we need to look for the precipitating focus. Suppose if the patient in stage one and suddenly if the patient is going for stage four NCAP, we need to always analyze this precipitating focus of infection. It could be a uh, nitrogenous focus or it could be a non-nitrogenous focus. There are plenty of precipitating focus that I'll be showing in my upcoming slides. So always we need to identify the causes, other causes of hepatic encephalopathy, identifying the precipitating factor. We need to reinitiate the treatment and always it keeps on assessing the patient every 72 hours. So if you made a wrong diagnosis, always do a imaging to reconfirm the diagnosis if you're missing something or not and admit the patient, start the empirical regimen and uh, uh, if needed, ship the patient to ICU to initiate the level of care. This is a basic outline. So always we need to look for the differential diagnosis of encephalopathy, whether the patient is hypoxic, hypercapnic, or whether the patient is acidotic or uremic or electrolyte disturbances or any 
alcohol mimics or any alcohol withdrawal effects or if the patient's having any septicemia or cerebral edema because of any of the folk. These are all the other causes to be assessed and precipitating factors. Always, this is a very interesting area based upon the nitrogenous and non-nitrogenous compounds, whether the patient is having septicemia or GA embrace or severe constipation or dietary protein overload and so many other things are there, the list of things so which I need to be the precipitating factors for hepatic encephalopathy and followed by we need to initiate the treatment for hepatic encephalopathy. That's the first line. This is a basic outline about uh, initiating the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. There's so much of drugs have been trying in the field, but the final line of treatment once a patient goes for stage three and four is hepatic transplant to be considered for most of the patients. And uh, this is a basic outline of the various drugs is going to act like uh, flumazenil and uh, I mean, lactose, op I mean, uh, and then uh, uh, urea cycle pathway drugs. And apart from that, there are so many load of BCA and other drugs. How does it going to act that have been shown in the diagram? And apart from that, as I discussed, we need to eliminate the precipitating factors treat simultaneously. If the patient is having GA bleeding, start the patient on blood transfusion, NG lavage, nasal gastric lavage has to be done, infection control well with antibiotic. And uh, if the patient is on any medications like benzodiazepines, stop it, correct the alteration disturbances. Constipation will be very significantly relieved because that's a significant precipitating factor for hepatic encephalopathy. And renal failure means always albumin can be used in the management of renal failure and sometimes dialysis. And these are all the for main intention for me is the medical management for hepatic encephalopathy. That's the main thing. It's hypoammonemia has to be bring down, has to be reduced. So one is by the diet and one is by the catharsis and by antibiotic support. And there are many drugs for ammonia clearance now. If you want to try enema, once the patient is stage three and four, where the patient couldn't able to take much for it, we can try enema, but there is a difficulty in placing the patient. We need to take the patient to my position, left little decubitals. And so there are so many, but if you're going to use lactose, you can think you can use at the dose of around 300 to 700, in 300 ml and 700 ml of saline can be tried, but uh, the enema, the cost is slightly more, and the difficulty is sometimes the patient can go for dehydration, sometimes the patient go for ileus, and sometimes the patient can go for uh, other complications to set in always the enema is a questionable issue when tackling a patient with hepatic encephalopathy. And apart from that, nutrition is the most important entity. Uh, to be taken care of. See, why means protein restriction is going to happen. Protein restriction, if there is evidence, is usual as the decrease in nitrogenous load. See, what is we need to target a protein approximately 1.5 to 2 kilograms per kg per day, and your calorie intake approximately around uh, 30 to 40 kilocalories per day has to be maintained. And that is the main thing if you are going to substitute the patients. Always, you need to use a vegetable source of protein and rather than using them in. Uh, I mean, um, those main uh, vegetable source of proteins is the most important thing. BCA and other supplementation also can be considered. So vegetable, why you need to consider your vegetable proteins, which means it predisposes to high fiber load and decreases the colonic pH and it improves the colonic motility and purgation, other things is going to improve and colonic pH, if it is going to come down, uh, ammonia absorption will be reduced. So ammonia absorption, if it is going to reduce, the pathway of hepatic encephalopathy will be definitely going to come down. This is about uh, uh, branch and amino acids, as we all know, valine, leucine, and isolation. These are all the branch and amino acids can be used. Nowadays, branch and amino acids can be considered also in the management of hepatic encephalopathy at the rate of around 0.25 grams per kg. Uh, see, what is the main role if we are going to use BCAA? It will be converting to glutamate and followed by the ammonia. So this will be useful. This glutamine, what is going to happen? It will prevent sarcopenia. This glutamine is going to accumulate in the muscle. So uh, these cirrhotic patients who are already having a low BCA to prevent sarcopenia and other complications, we need to substitute the patient with BCA and other drugs. The main area, what we are going to use is it's a non-absorbable disaccharides. As we all know that the lactose is semi-synthetic, I mean, non-absorbable disaccharides that being very frequently used, lactose and lactitol. So our intention when you are going to use lactose, so much of important effects are there. So what is the basic mechanism of action? We frequently ask most of the time. So what is the basic mechanism of action? So uh, it is having your major mechanism, like you all know it's cathartic. So it is predisposing for a laxative effect. It's going to eliminate the ammonia. That is one thing. 
second step is reduce ammonia synthesis and absorption how so in the intestinal bacteria it is going to convert to acetic acid if you're going to look into the diagram in the in, through the intestine going to convert into the acetic acid as well as lactic acid which is going to reduce the uh, ph which means the acidic media is going to this decreases the synthesis and absorption of ammonia which increases the movement of ammonia from blood to the GIT. So what is going to happen the blood from blood to GIT, the ammonia is going to move out and also the lactose if you're going to see in the colon when it is going to combine this ammonia if it is going to combine with hydrogen ions because of increase in the level of colonic lactate the hydrogen ions is going to combine with NH3 the ammonia which will form the ammonium ion so it is non-absorbable. So once ammonium ions forms, it will be eliminating and it will also promote the growth of non-urease producing bacteria, beneficial bacteria, so many other things will also involve in gut dysbiosis. So maintenance, other things has to be done. So there are the, these are all the major mechanisms, steps of lactose and lactitol. So we need to give at a rate of around 50 to 30 ml, or twice, I mean, two to three soft bowel movements. We can give twice a day or twice a day. It depends upon the clinical presentation. And sometimes if you want, you can go for lactose enema. Always the bloat and uh, sometimes over treatment, sometimes electrolyte disturbance can set in if you're going to use uh, lactose. But there are certain pros and cons for using lactose. So as we are describing, discussing about the pros, uh, the clinical anecdotal experience and comfort with the use of lactose uh, are being there, as well as in the cones, uh, the beneficial effect, and moreover, the risk of no improvement of overt hepatic encephalopathy is still being there when you are going, going to use lactose for a longer duration of therapy. Apart from that, these are all the various trials for lactose being tried. And... Uh, what are the various antibiotics can be tried in the management of hepatic encephalopathy like neomycin? Say so this all will act on the reduce the levels of ammonia. So how does it act? Neomycin increases uh, inhibits the intestinal glutamase, reduces ammonia, but neomycin no, no, we are not using much nowadays. Metronazole can be considered, paramomycin and vancomycin can be considered, but these drugs are not much of use nowadays. They're not my uh, it's not in the main mechanism of use right now in the management of hepatic encephalopathy. But the main thing is uh, rifaximin, it's one of the, I mean, it's a semi-synthetic drug and uh, I mean, uh, it's also disaccharin non-absorbable, which can be used as a minimally absorbed with a high barrier. So if you're going to use rifaximin in the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy, we need to use at the dose of around 550 milligrams. And if you're going to use rifaximin in the management of hepatic encephalopathy, always you should remember that how long you're going to use. Some studies are mentioned about two to three months. Some studies are mentioning about up to transplant consideration and even the prevention of primary prophylaxis in the prevention of secondary prophylaxis, how many days you're going to use rifaximin. There are so many questions that are still being there. If you're going to use rifaximin, whether there is any possibility of drug resistance. So if the, it's mainly based upon the DNA polymerase effect and RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So if there is any uh, inhibition or any pathway is going to interrupt in the management of rifaximin, that is also can predispose. So if you're going to use uh, rifaximin, it will act on both gram positive, gram negative, anaerobes, aerobe, everywhere it's going to act. And moreover, uh, some minimal side effects like flat lungs, abdominal pain, and if you're going to combination therapy of rifaximin and lactose, the beneficial effects of hepatic encephalopathy is dramatically very high. That has been proved in multiple trials. Multiple and apart from that, the multiple ammonia scavengers can be used like Lola, Lopa, L-lornithin, L-nastate, L-lornithin, phenylastate, l -lornithin. I mean, butyl estrate, so many phenyl butyl, so many other components being tried nowadays. See, these all the components is going to be involved in the urea cycle pathway of ammonia metabolism. So it will prevent the formation of glutamine and makes a synthesis of urea, which is predisposing, which will be predominantly eliminated in your urine. So what is going to happen? So it increases the carbon build possibility. If you are going to see the urea cycle, uh, when you are going to subject the patient, so either you are going to give Five, uh, five grams or 10 grams, what are the dose of low life you're going to use for a patient? It is going to increase the urea production by producing increased carbon will pass with synthetase. And most of the time we will be preferring IV route rather than going by a oral route. 
and sodium benzoate also can be used nowadays in the, as ammonia scavenging but uh, still many more studies to go on with, uh, about the beneficial effects of sodium benzoate and this is the outline of the diagram how the basic drugs like uh, in, uh, sodium benzoate as well as uh, lola and other drugs is going to act over the pathway of increasing levels of urea as an ammonia scavenging effect and apart from that, uh, like a sodium phenyl butyrate, see main thing, uh, every drug is going to be used in the uh, urea cycle pathway and glycerin phenyl butyrate, sodium phenyl butyrate, so many drugs been tried, l in phenyl acetate can be tried, but these are all still in phase two or phase uh, phase two B uh, studies uh, in decomposite cirrhosis, cirrhosis for a patient with overt hepatic encephalopathy. So, uh, these are all one more drug which is being tried like a spherical carbon absorber. See, this is what is that? It's mainly been used in Japan. Uh, what is this safe? But what they are going to do, it binds with uh, around 600 kilograms per meter square. What they've been trying, the external surface area of contact, we are going to use a spherical carbon absorbent. What's going to do? Uh, it binds to very small molecules in your gut. So it is pretty, it will be acting in TNF pathway, lipopolysaccharide, it means the endotoxin, and it is going to block the absorption. It is also uh, having uh, ammonia lowering properties, but these are all still in phase two study. And polyethylene glycol nowadays, many patients are being considered uh, around the four liters dose of PEG, but polyethylene glycol, the adverse events, it can be having a renal predisposition side effects. And next to that, the dehydration can be there and you can't use the patient with PEG for a longer duration of time. So these are all the, uh, adverse, adverse events when you are going to use a polyethylene glycol. So this is about the basic regimen about various doses what we are going to die. Try like sodium benzoate at a rate of 5.5 grams per meter square and I mean, visited phenyl butyrate uh, 5 to 12.4 and the uh, yes, which means nothing but uh, uh, yes to 1 to 0, which means spherical carbon if you are going to use. There are so many things which mean charcoal powder, everything will mean trial in the management of hepatic encephalopathy. And regarding the newer line of therapy, zinc can also always be considered in the management of, because it's a cofactor for urea cycle, can be added to the therapy, like already we are being using in the main primary condition of Wilson's. And also you can consider albumin, uh, because what is going to happen, the newer studies, what they may mention, if you're going to frequently uh, give the patient with albumin therapy, uh, the rate of 20% of albumin, albumin, if you're going to substitute the patient, what's going to happen? And the inflammatory pathway is going to come down. The interleukin toxicity, the tumor necrosis factor pathway activation, the circulatory overload, and the predisposition of the patients to cerebral edema, the increased levels of MAV, the cerebral perfusion pressure, the maintenance, everything is going to improve well with albumin substitution for the patient. So nowadays, what they've been substituting, always you can combine albumin with lactose in the management of hepatic and kephalopathy also. Flumazinil, as we all well know, is a benzodiazepine antagonist, can be considered, but it's a longer trial, it's still not more validated. And hyperalimentation, that's what I've been discussing. Hyperalimentation in the form of uh, calorie of around 35 to 40 kilocalories per kg per day, followed by proteins around 1.5 to 2 grams of protein per kilo. Now, always you should not restrict the protein more. Suppose if the patient is having very severe overt empathic and kephalopathy, at that point of juncture, we can restrict the protein minimally. But over, I mean, if you're going to restrict the protein more, what is going to happen? That will also predispose to less of glutamine formation. Your muscle will be predisposing to uh, urea cycle. I mean, uh, will be predisposing to uh, sarcopenia and other complication can set in. So always you should not restrict the protein too much. And apart from that, GABA, I mean, GABs are like GABA, uh, antibodies can be tried. These are all the other new molecules of trial, in trial and fecal microbiota transplant. As we all well know, uh, if you're going to use a capsulated form of fecal microbiota transplant also can be considered like what you're going to use in the management of alcoholic hepatitis and other therapy, like even for hepatic encephalopathy, we can try FMT, like what you're going to try FMT in antibiotic associated colitis and other conditions. And always say FMT, what is going to happen? We all should remember the gut dysbiosis is well known fact in predisposing etiology of hepatic encephalopathy. If the patient is having gut dysbiosis, the I mean, and the, stuff, I mean and the streptococcus and other bad bacteria levels is going to flurry, the clostridia levels is going to be high, the vermicos, femicos, and other protective bacterial levels is going to come down. So this fecal microbiota transplant is definitely having a beneficial role, but uh, the studies and other things have to be validated, which will be 
playing a role in gut dysbiosis uh, to prevent the pathway. As we all know, the gut dysbiosis, the bile acid, and other pathway like hyperalimentation, so many other pathways being involved in the pathogenesis, not only about hyperammonia we have to be discussed. And probiotics, many probiotics, it can be probiotic, prebiotic, or symbiotic, many probiotics can be tried, but not much of evidence in the management of hepatic and kephalopathy. And what is the form of probiotic, even lactobacillus form, even saccharomyces form. So even what are the form of probiotic if you're going to use the beneficial effect on bifidobacterium is still a questionable issue. As you all know, it's a living microorganism, which alters the intestine balance of microflora in the gut. So probiotics also can be considered the combination therapy with rifaximin, lactose, that what I've been discussed also have been considered. Regarding the surgery, uh, what are you are going to do if you're going to look in pain with the portosystemic shunt and other problems, you need to close the shunt. So portosystemic embolization is one therapy. Percutaneous transhepatic obliteration or percutaneous transhepatic sclerotherapy. There are newer innovations which is being in, used in the management. See, if you want to do a, a percutaneous transhepatic, you need to use a sclerosins. That can be tried in management of hepatic encephalopathy. And transhepatic obliteration can be done. And one more thing like BRTO. As we all know, BRTO is well known. It's a balloon retrograde transvenous obliteration. So BRTO, if you are going to use in the management of fundal varices, that BRTO can also be used uh, to, once a fundal is everything is going to control well, followed by the hepatic and cephalopathy episodes is going to come down. Even many newer guidelines, they have been mentioned about the role of BRTO to bring down the episodes of hepatic and cephalopathy. These are all the various surgical, like portosystemic shunt procedures, transcutaneous, percutaneous, uh, percutaneous transhepatic obliteration, sclerotherapy, BRTO, many things can be considered. Post chips, HE, no role of any drugs. We need to choose the diameter. Suppose if you are going to use the diameter of the chain, what is four tips? There's nothing but a trans jugular intra hepatic portosystem shunt. So, uh, so what is the I mean, if you're placing a P, if you, uh, uh, you know, so if, suppose if you're going to plan the patient for tips, if you're going to establish a connection between the hepatic and the portal vein, so what is going to happen? The post chips in the patient is going to develop hepatic NCAF, that is high possibility. Uh, for the patient to go for hepatic end curve because of the stent diameter. And only when you're choosing a good stent of around uh, 8 to 10 uh, millimeter of size, that's the main thing to prevent the post chips and other complications. And secondary prophylaxis, always to be considered by the duration, how long you're going to give until the patient considered for liver transplant or any other thing. The combined lactose and rifaximin therapy can be tried. And for primary prophylaxis, no strong consensus data has still been established. And for the prevention of uh, NAFTA tapes, always based upon the strength diameter, other things to be assessed. And uh, no proper drugs for the primary prophylaxis has been uh, I mean, accepted in the management of hepatic and cephalopathy. So usually it is indefinitely coming to be given, but the duration is not being controlled. Some patients being used for two months, three months, six months, these therapies, but uh, uh, unless and otherwise if the patient, if the patient is having autoimmune hepatitis, if you're going to put the patient steroids, antivirals, if you're going to treat the patient, this secondary prophylaxis is going to improve very well. And uh, the patient, every complication is going to set I mean, come down, then you can stop the secondary prophylaxis. Otherwise, indefinite prophylactic therapy has to be considered for most of the patients. And officially, like prometheus system, mass, albumin dialysis, so many other things can be considered. But this is all a questionable issue in the management of hepatic end curve. Stage three and four, uh, artificial liver support can be considered as a bridge, but liver transplant is a final entity to be considered in the patient with hepatic encephalopathy. And before concluding, the few points to summarize in my discussion, if you want to tackle the hepatic encephalopathy properly with a clinical history assessment, the scoring systems in your clinical practice, analyze the patient well, always rule out hepatic encephalopathy, uh, make hepatic encephalopathy only as a diagnosis of exclusion, rule out all the primary focus, treat all the precipitating causes, and look for the identifying focus, like what is the etiology, what is the trigger, and where is the presentation? Is there any evidence of focal neurological signs and lesions? Do a basic workup. If needed, do a imaging and other things. The clinical assessment, and admit the patient in the proper center and proper level of care. Refer the patient promptly to the gastroenterologist regarding the therapy to be considered. And apart from that, the first line of care, 
lack close and other cathartics to be initiated followed by eliminating the precipitating focus uh, rifaximin can be considered and by artificial support devices and other mechanisms other multiple modalities of drugs and consider the patient early for liver transplant once a patient been diagnosed with covert features because within a period of three years there is high possibility for the patient to go for overt hepatic encephalopathy and most of the time we couldn't be able to revive the patient even after liver transplant uh, the patient can go most sometimes the patient may succumb to die and uh, always you need to take uh, the presentation at the earlier point of time to tackle this effective hepatic encephalopathy in the right way with this i would like to rest my presentation and i'm very happy to take up your questions if anything is there to share about thank you you all excellent talk uh, dr arun thank you sir so as a neurologist Are there any questions to so, as a neurologist yeah arun uh, uh, i'll uh, i like to talk about a neurologist perspective in hepatic encephalopathy uh, yes, most yes. of the time i would I'm say around i would say more than 90% of the times the first encounter of a neurologist with a hepatic encephalopathy patient will be in mostly in an icu uh, so we have been called in for a patient who is drowsy maybe stuporous maybe in deep comatose state state, uh, state and we have been called in to assess neurological status uh, so in a drowsy patient uh, with a, a clinical setting of a hepatic failure who has an astraxis uh, the uh, diagnosis is going to be straightforward um uh, and we use uh, eeg for two reasons one to look for uh, transients there are two types of transients that we will look one is there a triphasic wave and second there is intermittent delta activity so these are the things that we look at eeg and one more thing what we look at is any uh, overt uh, eeg is electro uh, electrical signs of a seizure with a non convulsive status they can present with seizures so these are the three things what what we will be looking at in eeg and uh, uh, most of the patients we will look for a brain imaging uh, though mri will give us more information uh, practically uh, ct is the one which is uh, practical uh, the reasons are number one most of the patients with hepatic dysfunction will be having some coagulation abnormalities so a bleed has to be ruled out uh, number two uh, the logistic issues uh, the patient may be drowsy and we will not be able to give uh, uh, sedation because it it might again uh, precipitate this uh, Uh, sen uh, the sensorium will be down with the sedation so and then uh, intubation it uh, uh, intubated patient it's uh, the logistics will be difficult so ct is the uh, preferred one initially uh, to look for any uh, to rule out uh, a stroke or uh, uh, other structural uh, disorders um, so the it in, this is uh, straight forward but then in case of a, uh, um, a covert uh, hepatic encephalopathy it's not that easy uh, because the patient comes in a preclinical uh, status Uh, so here we need to be uh, a bit more uh, uh, most of the time either the patient will complain of some attention deficits maybe fatigue maybe uh, disturbed sleep now these uh, the symptoms are very very subtle and uh, uh, and maybe uh, the patient might not complain maybe the relatives may be the one who have noted those and brought the patient to us uh, and most of the time there will be not much clinical uh, findings uh, so we we should be looking at uh, psychomotor testing mainly for attention uh executive functions uh, visio spatial uh, dis disorientation uh, so uh, psychomotor speed and these are the things that uh, what will we will be uh, looking at in a patient with an uh, covert uh, uh, or preclinical hepatic encephalopathy and in any patient with hepatic encephalopathy the things what a neurologist will be looking for is one type uh, great whether it's episodic whether it's recurrent or chronic and whether it is a spontaneous one or or is it precipitated by uh, something Uh, in a patient who uh, has who doesn't have um, uh, much of hepatic failure but still we uh, suspect hepatic encephalopathy we will rule out other things like uh, it's a di diagnosis of exclusion there uh, so uh, in a patient with hepatic encephalopathy i will be very careful with csf analysis because especially in a patient who has an acute deterioration uh because uh, the raised icp is more common with acute uh, hepatic encephalopathy so raised icp uh, it uh, it will be it's, it's going to be catastrophic uh so and uh, most of the time i read uh, uh, this recent knowledge for me that uh, raised icp and uh, uh, ammonia levels correlates well that is if it is more than 200 uh, then uh, the patient uh, most probably the patient has a raised icp 
uh, and will be an, especially in a patient with an acute hepatic encephalopathy and also uh, hypomagnesemia and hyponatremia are these are the associated things uh, with hepatic encephalopathy which can uh, uh, add uh, fire to the uh, problem basic problem uh, with that a neurologist perspective with that and the treatment is obviously it's you are going to take it we usually give an antiepileptic uh, medication um, um, i think the remaining treatment part is yours thank you thank you thank you very much dr prabhash for enlightening in uh, enlightening discussion about the bad and couple of the neurological perspective and um, what is said is absolutely true definitely uh, any patient who presents to us with neurological deterioration or other complications to be assessed properly before labeling them as hepatic and capillary per se the most important entity because non converse status as what you told is absolutely true most of the time many patients can be landing up and alcohol withdrawal effects also to be analyzed properly what you are saying is true and absolutely accepted thank you doctor and is there any questions for us to chat right now sir yeah there are a few questions uh... okay number one the role of uh, ppa in hepatic encephalopathy so role of ppi in hepatic encephalopathy actually this is uh, uh, ppi in gr is well known the role of ppi in hepatic encephalopathy the problem is what is going to happen if you are going to use proton pump inhibitor uh, recently i read a paper about the usage of proton pump inhibitor what is going to happen uh, it is going to alter your gut microbiota so once a gut microbiota is well known pathophysiology for hepatic encephalopathy to be discussed right now so if the gut microbiota is going to be perturbed if the gut microbiota is going to be disturbed so the patient can be having worsening of hepatic encephalopathy so most of the time if you are going to use ppi as a diet dose if you are going to suspect use of ppi for a long duration of time that dysbiosis will be setting in so the uh, chances of worsening of hepatic encephalopathy is still high but there are some ppis which will be will not be having this kind of like rabiprazole uh actually which is being you know, not much of a potential toxicity to cause hepatic encephalopathy but apart from that the role of ppi is a questionable issue not to be used in patients with hepatic encephalopathy the next question what they have asked is uh, what is the lola dose lola l or nitin l aspartate yeah. uh, dose of lola what we are going to start with the uh, uh, multiple studies are giving various doses some patients have been receiving 5 grams in 250 ml of saline uh, for a period of around 2 to 3 hours will be giving and some patients will be giving around uh, 10 grams and some patients will be giving at around 20 to 40 grams also can be tried but initially 5 grams in 200 250 ml of saline what's being used uh, twice daily once at a time will be i mean uh, uh most beneficial effect uh, in preventing the patient to progression of hepatic encephalopathy so that's uh, my experience 5 grams or 10 grams will be combining for most of the patients along with albumin and lactose the next question is uh, how common is uh, covert uh, hypo- uh, hypoxic uh, sorry hepatic encephalopathy Uh, I think I have discussed in my initial slides that covert hepatic encephalopathy rather than overt will be very uh, uh, tough to diagnose, and most of the patients in in the background of cirrhosis will be having evidence of covert hepatic encephalopathy. Around 20 to 80 percent of the population can present uh, with evidence of covert, rather than around 30 to 40 percent can be present with the evidence of overt hepatic encephalopathy. So most of the time, covert is difficult to recognize, but many patients usually present with evidence of covert hepatic encephalopathy in the background of cirrhosis. next okay this is not related to this topic but still i don't think any webinars will not be completed with this question that uh, what are the covid related uh, uh, liver liver uh, problems <laughs> covid related liver problems there are many professors senior consultants i think been discussed about that see if you are going to discuss something about covid related liver problems uh, the dire- direct effect on hepatic encephalopathy it's not much rather than what is going to happen if the patient is having covid problem uh the patient will be having alteration in your enzyme levels the ast level is going to be altered the halt level may be altered because of the sepsis because of the sars cot cov2 receptors being involved and uh, the patient will be having alteration in enzyme levels sometimes the patient will be having evidence of jaundice and sometimes the patient will be having evidence of inflammatory septic pathway is going to be activated which will predispose the patient with multi organ failure it sometimes can be supposed to be hepatic failure and also some patient can present with colitis this is all the various ga picture that in the background of covid 
but uh, this kind of presentation once a patient is going for multi organ other system going to be involved and the acl of acute and chronic liver failure and other pathology also nowadays is being reported new entity once a patient is developing this kind of complications there is a possibility for the patient to go for hepatic encephalopathy and uh, the role of uh, cs of lactulose cs of lactulose hmm, lactulose yeah lactate sir uh, lactulose Lact, yes, uh, levels, levels, levels. Yeah, yes, yes, ah. lactate levels, lactate levels. Yeah, I'm sorry. CSM lactate. I think it's a spelling mistake there. <laughs> CSM lactate. CSM lactate. Uh, see, actually, so what we've been uh, discussed initially, the role of CSM glutamine has been well established uh, to diagnose a patient with hepatic and calf. Uh, CSM lactate also been used, but not much in hepatic and calf. If you are going to suspect a septic focus, so you have to discuss. If you are going to suspect a septic meningitis, either focus, if the CS of lactate, if it is going to be more than three millimoles, so the patient is having evidence of uh, uh, septic meningitis, and encephalitis is still high. But hepatic encephalopathy also, if you are going to look for CS of lactate levels, uh, the ratio will be around more than two or 2.5, 1.5 to 3. But uh, these are all uh, subjective variation and moreover, it has not been well yielded in the trials to be discussed. I think one more question is there. Uh, normal, normal CPP. Normal uh, CPP. So normal cerebral perfusion, the maintenance, we need to take care of the intracranial tension when the patient with managing a patient of cerebral edema. And we should always maintain the CPP, CPP at the rate of around 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. That is a maintenance of CPP. And we need to tackle the intracranial mean ICT. I mean, uh, intracranial pressure has to be maintained. When you're managing a patient, obviously you need to target the map. The map has to be raised in a, sus I mean, a, suspect in a reasonable way with the admin and other support. And these are all the main thing if you're going to manage a patient with the ACL of any acute liver failure and the patient, if you're going to manage with other complications, always we need to manage when the patient is having evidence of hepatic and the CPP, uh, normal CPP should be around 60 to 80, which is the target to be maintained most of the time in to prevent race ICT. I think that's it. Questions are done. I think no more questions. Any other questions to be involved? Is there no more questions? Shall we uh, close the uh, talk today? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Prabhash, and thank you very much, the respected audience and other consultants who have been parting, who are going to be part in this program. And uh, even in this uh, post-COVID, I mean, even in the COVID system, I mean, uh, season of our own during this pandemic. But even then, if you are, it's, uh, you are spending most of the time with us, and uh, thank you very much to logging into the session. Thank you, Dr. Prabhash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.